Yes, we do have uh, walk-up music for everybody tonight. Um, and uh, just you guys will appreciate it. We all got to pick our own, so that was mine. So, so you'll see what all of the other startups uh, decided to do for, uh, for walk-up music. For uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm Rahul Bawa. I am uh, chairman of Pipeline. On behalf of everyone involved in Pipeline, I'd like to thank you for coming today. Front row's wide open, Mike. Go for it. Um, so uh, we have an exciting group, and I, I know you guys have been talking to the startups already. We've got six startups that are going to change the world. And that's not just a uh, tagline. I, I truly do believe that. Um, hopefully you guys will come to that realization at the end of the program as well. So what is Pipeline? Our mission, at the end of the day, is to commercialize the world's leading startup technologies. OK, great. That sounds kind of nice. How do you actually do it? We leverage everyone in the region. At the end of the day, we have a leading regional water ecosystem. And most people don't know that. Now, obviously, some of you in the room, I think uh, one of our startups called them water geeks, um, which would be some of the crowd today. You know that. But one of the questions that really comes up as, as I've talked about pipeline is why here? Why in this region? What's so special about Cincinnati? Uh, when you talk about that. Well, as you may or may not know, in 1788, Cincinnati was formed on a river. Gee, there's some water there, right? Trade was pretty important back then. That's why Cincinnati, originally called Losanoville in 1788, but for the trivia fans in the room, but um, was formed on the river. You've probably all seen this. 1871, Tyler Davidson Fountain on Fountain Square, also called the genius of water. Most people don't know that. So there's a lot of water expertise that's in this region. 1913, the first federally funded water program in this region. Not anywhere else in the US, in this region. The EPA has their largest water research facility, once again, in this region. But I'm not done. The utilities that we have, and these are just three of them, world leaders in their use of water or uh, cleaning up wastewater, um, or as you hopefully saw when you walked in, having good tasting water. So this is really a long string of expertise around water that we've had in the region. So obviously what's next? Pipeline. We started Pipeline uh, two years ago. Um, Antony and I and Chris Lawson were in this building a little less than two years ago, and it was a conversation that talked about, so you know what, you think we should ought to do a water thing here? And I'm, I'm very proud to say that, you know, it, it's obviously a reality, but it's come a long way. I'd like to thank the group of companies and organizations that helped us start. This is the founding group that got together and said, let's go make this happen. Now, Antony is going to get up and talk a little bit about what we did in the class, but one thing I will share is this year we had 75 different people, that's right, 75 different people from these organizations talk to, come in, mentor, and advise our startups. That says a lot about the region. I started creating this slide and I said, oh, I'll just put the logos of all the companies. Well, it wouldn't fit on one slide. Okay? So this is, this is the next slide. So, and it was an alphabetical order by company name. So lots of companies that have actually helped and lots of organizations that have helped. The other thing I'll say is if, if there's one thing that I want you guys to remember about Pipeline, we look for the best companies in the world and we feel like we have that. But we exist for one reason or one reason only, and that's to get them customers. I'm proud to say that every single one of these cohort has a customer that came out of Pipeline. Okay. Our criteria is you have to have a product ready for customers. Okay. So it's a little bit different than some accelerators. We're a little bit further ahead, but you've got to be ready for customers because 
what this region does, and you saw all the logos on this and the other uh, slides, this region has people ready to work with innovators. And that's the exciting part. So now I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Seppi. Anthony is the director of Pipeline. He's the one who makes everything happen day to day. Um, all of the emails, the tweets, the reminders you saw, you can blame him for. So uh, here's Anthony. Here we come, come with me. There's a world out there that Thank we you. should see. Take my hand. All right. So. So Raul talked about our, our six startups that are part of the program. So, so how did we get, how did we get here? And I'm not talking metaphysically or philosophically speaking. How did we get here? But, you know, what I what I'm talking about is how did we land on these six startups that are participating in the pipeline program today? You know, obviously we've got a passion for for water and solving water challenges. And so, you know, back some nine, twelve months ago. We went out and talked to manufacturers throughout the region. We talked to business. We talked to industry. We, we talked to consumers. We went to trade shows. And we identified those challenges that are out there in the water space. You know, challenges from water reuse, water recycling, water, in, uh, water infrastructure, which was a huge issue in the infrastructure arena. You know, there's going to be there's going to have to be billions of dollars spent over the next 15, 20 years to bring our infrastructure up to uh, up to a, a, a point where you know, water is manageable. And, and so there's infrastructure, there's consumer innovations uh, that are a piece of that, and data analytics is huge as well. It's coming more into play in the water space. And, and so those are some challenges. Those are some different angles that we looked for when we sourced you know this this current class. Uh, and so, you know, with those problems in hand, with those challenges in hand, we, we went out there and looked for, for startups that are solving those, oops, solving those issues or solving those challenges. And, and so, you know, when we put out that call for applications, we got applications from all over the world. This is an international program. Water is an all, uh, you know, all immersive problem throughout the world. So. We got applications from over 20 countries representing six continents. Antarctica did not make that list from a continent <laughs> perspective. But, you know, that's, that's, what, that's how we landed on these six. You know, we, we went through several rounds of filtering, you know, from the, from the top down to 10, down to this six that are going to talk to you today. So just a, you know, very rigorous, very arduous process that we went through. And we took it very seriously. Uh, and we had an evaluation board that was involved as part of that process, uh, representing, uh, you know, industry and manufacturers. You know, Startup Cincy was part of that as well. Uh, so very representative of the region and of the community. So with that, I wanted to introduce, you know, the startups that made it to this, this level. So we've got six of them, and I'll go through them one by one here. So we've got Dropwater call them the magicians of Menlo Park, <laughs> out of Menlo Park, California. And they are magicians, so they'll, uh, they'll be talking to you today. Got Scott Edwards, he's the founder. We got Folia Water, Jonathan and Terry. And they've been kind of our nomads over the past four or five years, so we didn't know where to put them. But their market, they're going after Mexico, so we'll put them in Mexico. We've got Micronic Technologies and Karen Sorber. She's the, the founder out of Wise, Virginia. We've got Water Warriors and Steve Chamberlain, and they're here in Cincinnati. We've got Adviso, Julian Lancia, and they're out of London. And we've got Robert Lee out of Sydney, Australia. So you can just see the scope and the reach of our program, just in terms of you know, who we're bringing in to this region, you know, Cincinnati, Hamilton, Northern Kentucky, in terms of you know, the resources that are here and, and what they're taking advantage of. So that's what we got you know, with, our, with our cohort 2018. So taking that one step further, what do, what do they do while they're here in, 
Cincinnati and, as I mentioned, Hamilton and Northern Kentucky. What do they do? I mean, we go through the traditional accelerator you know, workshop model. You know, we'll, we'll work with them uh, on their business plan, uh, you know, their financials, you know, introduce them to mentors throughout the region. You know, so that's all part of the program. But our number one goal, as Rahul mentioned earlier, is to really have them leave our program with customers, our partners, you know, throughout the region. And as Raul mentioned, I'm happy to say that, you know, all six of these will continue to have a presence here in the Cincinnati area going forward. I mean, they, they you know, the, the startups that I talked about from Australia and, and, you know, London, they're talking about continuing their operations here in the region. So that's, that's huge, and that's a huge win for, this region and a huge win for the startups that are taking advantage of those, the water resources. So, this guy's pretty happy. This guy's very happy. So that's Robert E. Lee, or sorry, Robert Lee. Um, Robert Lee, he's got the sewer scout, you hear more about that later. He's the guy from Australia and, you know, he just met with a customer and he's very happy about the, the result of that. So. And I'll just leave with this. I'm not going to read this back to you, but I mean, this is how we've got to be moving forward. I mean, this is visionary stuff. You know, this is, you know, if, you, if you're a business, you're a manufacturer or whatever, and you're not thinking about the, the implications of, of water and where we're going with water, you're in trouble. Um, and obviously this guy's a visionary and he saw that. And again, I'm not going to read that back to you, but that's huge. So, so with that being said, we'll, we'll kick off the, the cohort pitch portion of our program, and I'm going to turn it over to Folia Water. I started reading the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof. And Nicholas Kristof tells us, any brand of toothpaste is peddled with far more sophistication than the life-saving work of aid groups. And what he means by that is that the consumer marketing towards us as the wealthy is not done well. But the way I remembered it was product sales are not sold to the poor in a sophisticated way. Well, Colgate is the number one brand in the world. 68% of the world bought Colgate toothpaste last year. There's no sustainable development goal for toothbrushing. What does it mean? It means that consumer goods has the ability to reach profitably all across the world. We've invented at Folia Water, the world's first water filter that costs pennies and not dollars. Each of these simple pieces of paper, we package them like coffee filters and provides one week of safe, germ-free water for an entire family for a week. The silver in our paper kills bacteria and viruses, while the physical paper itself screens out germs, parasites, and, and um, dirt. We're able to do that for only 50 cents for an entire week of safe, germ-free water for an entire family. Retail, 50 cents for 50 liters. But it costs us only three cents to make each piece of paper. That's possible because we patented a process to utilize standard specialty paper mills as the world's largest nano factories and lowest cost, all with no capital modifications required. That's possible because we're a founding team of scientists. Hi, my name is Dr. Jonathan Levine. Part of my PhD at Columbia University was water in developing countries, where my boss's boss was Jeff Sachs, who was the head of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. My co-founders studied fiber science at Cornell, and for her PhD at McGill University, they asked her a very simple question. Can you invent a kind of paper that can provide safe, clean drinking water? Several years after that, I asked her a much simpler question. I asked her if she would marry me. My wife is my co-founder. In 2015, her story went viral. She was number one most read on bbcnews.com, and we were made Time Magazine's Invention of the Year. So we formed a company, because companies are scalable, fully a water. It's our elephant drinking water. There we go. So the question for the company is, how do we make safe drinking water 
in the base of the pyramid a commercial opportunity? How do you utilize so social enterprise and business to become a scalable company for universal access to safe water profitably? So groundwater is a problem of the destitute. 663 million is the kind of number you read. Lack access to upgraded water. This means that they're drinking unimproved water sources. But safe water, contaminated water with germs in it, is a much larger problem. This is not the destitute humanitarian market. This is 2.1 billion people who live in cities around the world, right? Who live in mega cities, are the low income working poor, and live in places like Mumbai, Bangkok, and where I was yesterday, Mexico City, right? This is the working poor, the three billion people who make two to $10 a day, collectively earning and spending $5 trillion, right? Three billion people's largest consumer segment. It's not the destitute, it's not the humanitarian market, it's a paying market. There we go. The emerging markets in general are a $58 billion bottled water market, right? This is mostly the upper class and the middle class, but we're 90% savings. So we can go down into the lower class, the working class. Well, our version one sold out. We sold $120,000 to various NGOs in the humanitarian channel who helped improve the product. So we worked with Unilever, Rotary, United Nations. And with that, we were able to test our product and go from laboratory things to a completed product with feedback like this. If my husband does not buy this, I will write poetry to raise money so I can buy this myself. Not too, many cons not too many companies have that kind of consumer engagement. At the end of my focus group on Tuesday, I was asked, okay, but where do we buy it? That's the thing we're asked every single time we run a focus group. So NGOs aren't scalable, but consumer goods retail is. Why are we in Cincinnati at Pipeline Water? It's because this is the capital of consumer goods in the United States, right? So these are mom and cop pop kiosks, the tienditas and warangs that are all around the world, the sari sari shops in the Philippines. This is an existing distribution network that knows how to move product and knows how to sell things, knows how to do consumer marketing and knows how to push things out. So, it, so what goes on right now with water filters is that things are sold as appliances. So you have things that are like refrigerators, this is Unilever's Purit, but these are capital intensive and you have dedicated sales, cha sales channels and each thing is like a little mini business. Consumer goods on the other hand, fully scalable, Chlorine tastes like a pool, and of course, bottled water right now is expensive. We're 90% savings. So what does this look like as a business? Our unit financials are three cents for paper. We have one penny of silver in each. Package for seven cents. 50 cents, one, lit one cent per liter, 50 liters is 50 cents. But we're able to give a 60% margin to master distributors. Because every country has food and beverage importer distributors who can handle pushing this out through existing channels. What does that look like? So 20 cents wholesale to folio water is $10 a year for a family, right? They're going in and spending 50 cents a week. But at a kiosk at 100 families, this looks like 1,000 a year. Okay, well, how do we build that up? 10,000 families is 100,000, and this is what a million families looks like. Well, there are 800,000 tienditas serving 60 million base of the pyramid consumers in Mexico alone. The island of Java in Indonesia has 140 million people. 260 million people total in Indonesia. And wait till we go to India. If I had 20 cents for every single person in the BOP in India, we'd be a billion dollar company. So what are we doing? We're testing in multiple markets with really um, very highly qualified consumer market testing companies. So BOP Inc. in Bangladesh, Copernic in Indonesia. I'm wearing a Tinoli, sh Tinoli shirt out of Mexico, they're our partners. I told them I would wear their shirt on stage, why? Because they're our network in country. For $25,000, $30,000 each country, we get consumer data and we down select to which place is the consumer pull the best because we can cherry pick and start at the top at the best market and go down. So we start with 10 stores. This is a three by three block region. Very cheap, very efficient market testing. Scale out to 50 stores, have that retail recipe Anam, 40 wholesalers in Mexico can get you to 800,000 tienditas. So this is a matter of the right qualified master distributor able to handle the right advertising and promotion because again, we're not reinventing anything. This is just the standard CPG distribution chain. We've raised a bunch of money before, been in 500 startups, had a bunch of prizes. More importantly, I've talked to all these people in the last, none of these people. 
These people, so, so Mike McCready is the CEO of Safeway.com, Adam is the head of emerging brands at Clorox, Raja was in charge of a couple countries for Coca-Cola. That's who we talked to on CPG distribution. We have similar level advisors for paper, for water, and for startups. And why are we here in Cincinnati? Because the Tinder Barrage from P&G Pure, formerly, has agreed to help us as an advisor. And so when this gets updated, he's gonna be in with the water people. <laughs> so where does this all go? There's a long history of consumer health products being sold in stores all around the world. Procter & Gamble sanitary pads, Unilever antimicrobial soap, Danone Activia yogurt. Okay? If you're in every single store in all these developing countries, one, we've already been acquired by a large company to get to that kind of scale. But they don't need to prove scale of distribution, they need a consumer retail recipe. But if that happens, we're a billion dollar product and brand. Thank you. Cincinnati. All right. Also Cincinnati. Uh, on behalf of Water Warriors, just want to say uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, let us share a little bit about ourselves. And to start off first, I want to talk about a problem that is global. And that problem is that every day in waterways across the world, okay, they're being contaminated. All right. Now, there's plenty of uh, different contaminants that might go in the water, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on two in particular, and that'd be nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, before I became a water warrior, I mean, I had no idea. Nitrogen, phosphorus, pollutants uh, didn't register with me. But the fact of the matter is that they are very harmful, right? harmful to the environment, but they also cause toxic algae blooms, uh, which is a severe problem. So severe, in fact, that uh, algae blooms are one of the most costly and widespread environmental problems. And that's, uh, that's from the EPA. So how do you address this problem? Right? It's simple, right? You just keep the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water. Unfortunately, many wastewater treatment plants, they're just not equipped to remove that nitrogen and phosphorus. So, Although the problem has been identified, right, they know they got to stop it, and so they put stricter discharge limits on the nitrogen and phosphorus, but that's just not enough because uh, they're not equipped to remove it. And I talked to thousands of treatment plants, and if they haven't seen those restrictions yet, they know they're coming. So that's where we come in. Right, we are the wastewater experts, and we bring with us innovative wastewater solutions to treat uh, water and remove those harmful contaminants, in particular, nitrogen and phosphorus. So how do we do it? First, I want to clear up maybe uh, a little misunderstanding. Uh, bacteria many times gets a, a bad rap, right? Many times people talk about bacteria because they got sick. I read, uh, ruin their family vacation or whatever. But the truth of the matter is that bacteria is good. All right? Bacteria is what is out there in the water taking those harmful contaminants out. So they're working hard for us. So bacteria is good. And what we try to do, we try to give them a home. So really, we're nothing more than real estate moguls <laughs> in the bacterial world. Right? So our products look like this. We have our biomedia products, one that you have like a half a football there, which would be a full uh, football with the other half on, uh, and then our waving biomedia. Uh, and those, depending on the application, would determine which product would be used. And then you can use those independently, or you can use them in conjunction with our microbubble aeration. And I'll go into more depth uh, on each product here. All right, so first, super biomedia. Right, this is our product that uh, is shaped like a football. And uh, the applications for the super biomedia 
are aeration basins, okay, uh, tanks, as well as trickling filters. And again, you, you introduce these products into the water and we specially coat them. So as soon as you put them in the water, the bacteria knows there's media, media there. And the bacteria will attach itself to the foam and the biomass will continue to grow. Right? And it almost creates an ecosystem where the biomass will continue to grow and decay, grow and decay. So this would be the application for uh, aeration basins, things of that nature, because these, these footballs will tumble within the water as they are neutrally buoyant. Uh, so that's super biomedia. Waving biomedia, same concept. You have the open-celled foam, uh, which interacts very well with the water and gives a lot of different nooks and crannies within the foam for the bacteria to live and to thrive. And especially when you look at the open cell foam, you have the ability for different types of bacteria to, to grow within, within the media. And you have your nitrifiers on the outside and denitrifiers on the interior, which will give you simultaneous nitrification, denitrification. And then finally, uh, microbubble aeration. So microbubble aeration, in many cases that we see, will save treatment plants up to 50% in energy costs because it's a very efficient system. Uh, there's no compressors, there's no blowers, so uh, the way that it produces the bubbles is very energy efficient. Uh, in addition to that, the bubbles are the perfect size, right? 50 microns or less. And what that means is that they have the ability to stay in the water for a much longer time. Like when you were a kid and you used to go into a swimming pool and blow a bubble, the thing rises immediately, right? These bubbles will stay in the water for hours, which give the bacteria the oxygen that they need to grow and thrive. So the major benefits of our products, again, whether you use them in conjunction or uh, separately, uh, they remove the nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? So that's a, that's a big problem that, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, it reduces sludge, okay? Increases the facility capacity, all right? And it's retrofitable, which means there's no infrastructure build out, right? And I talked about the energy savings with the microbubble aeration. Water Warriors team. I think our nickname, I think he had to be called the, the least intimidating warrior he's ever seen. But uh, we have uh, John Gradick, our CEO. He's kind of like Hannibal from the A-Team, right? He loves when a plan comes together. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Govin, you can insert, you know, the smartest individual, you know, alive or not alive, right? You know, put Einstein in there. Rob Foster's kind of like MacGyver. And uh, I was once uh, called... Uh, a cross between Harry Potter and Mr. Bean. I don't know if it was a compliment, I don't think it was, but you know, we'll say that. So uh, looking at uh, how we're doing right, on the financial side, you know, these are our forecasts uh, for 2018, 1.75 million. I'm happy to report that we're 30% to goal. Um, our average quote value is typically around $400,000. And uh, we have uh, three projects in the water and uh, we have a couple more projects coming at the end of this year. So you see the forecast for 2019, 2020. Uh, we feel good about those numbers. And the, the market is massive. I mean, there's, uh, it's massive right now and it's only gonna get bigger because the need is going to grow. I wanna close with a story. They're a client of ours now, but this was our first meeting with them Fortune 500 food and beverage company. We were about 15 minutes into the meeting and, he, and the, the plant leader stopped us. He said, oh, oh, oh. And then he said these words. He said, it's become obvious to me that we have been dealing with several civil engineers. You are wastewater experts. So why did he say that? The reason is because the project that we were talking about, they just had an engineering company come in and they told them that project, $20 million. Right? We came in, we told them, $3 million. And the reason is because that engineering company, their solution was build a bigger plant, build more, need more tanks, need another lagoon. Where we're saying, use innovation and technology, use the footprint that you have, and treat the water even better than creating a new plant. Well, I encourage you to visit our booth, which is over here in the front and uh, hope to see you over there. Thank you for your time.
if you had one shot or one opportunity. Hi everybody, I'm Julian. I'm one of the co-founders from Adviso. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our solution and our company. But uh, ah. <laughs> let me first start with uh, a little story about me. Uh, this is close to my hometown. This is where I'm born, the region I'm born in France, in the south of France. Uh, you can see the, light, the lake in the middle. This is one of the longest and biggest artificial lake in the southwest of France, at the Lac of Serpenson. It was built in 1961. Um, and that's where I grew up when I was adolescent. This is the same lake a couple of years ago, uh, probably in the same zone, May, June, after the snow disappeared. Uh, it's full of water. And that's the lake uh, a month ago where the water completely disappeared. Um, uh, it haven't been that low in water since 1961, the years they created the, the, the lake. And that's, you know, that's probably the worst draft and misuse of water uh, of, of the region I've ever had. Uh, that's, this little previous story is one of the reasons I decided to create Adviso. We would like to provide people an opportunity to leave an impact and act and, and change um, uh, their way of consuming water and energy to potentially avoid situations like that. Uh, and for that, we are actually doing a, creating a solution, a very personalized way of engaging consumers using behavioral science. Uh, so I'm going to, to try to explain you how uh, we want to revolutionize customer engagement. But let me first ask you a couple of questions. How many of you have checked your email today? Yeah. This week as well? How many of you have checked your email now? <laughs> yeah, that's very bad. Anyway, how many of you have checked your bank account today, yesterday, this week? Uh, how many of you have looked at your household energy and water use? Today? Yeah. yeah. This month? Never? <laughs> Well, there's, there's a couple of energy and water geek in the, in the room. It's good to see you guys. There's not a lot. But what about the rest of the room? What, what, why don't you, we have, we create an opportunity for you to engage on that area. And that's one of the things we, we would like to do at, at Viso. So, um, you know, as we can see, there is obviously an engagement problem. There's an attention problem. So nine minutes, what, nine minutes per year. What's this number? This is the time, the number of minutes per year people think about their water and energy bill. Um, this, is, this is not even with their water and energy use, that bill. It's very low. In, in comparison, you spend about 20 hours a month on Facebook. So what does it mean? Well, oh, it left again. What does it mean for the utilities? This have an impact. Um, uh, in general, it creates a lot of problems. Misengaged people, um, they create low customer satisfaction, a lot of bill complaint, uh, problem with the metering, problem with the call center. Um, uh, overall, it creates a lot of frustration also for the employee working for the utilities. So overall, increasing cost to serve and very low leverage to reduce environmental impact. So how do we solve that issues? Um, so we know people are the solution. I mentioned it at the beginning, um, that by engaging people that we will change something. And if we want to raise attention on people, we need, we, you, all of us need to change how we, we understand water and energy use. And in, in, in the end, how we engage with our utilities. So what do we do at Adviso? So we have created um, a highly flexible customer analytic solution uh, to help utility consumer um, to uh, be help them to better understand how they consume. How do we do that? We turn utilities data into personalized insight uh, for the consumer and for the utilities as well, yourself. And we do that already in more than four different countries with almost 10 customers. Uh, all paying customer, and we have about 5 million households in our database already where we engage people today. How does it work? 
um, we have developed a software for utilities. So we take data from the utilities, uh, billing data, meter data, any type of data that can be useful. We mix that data with third party data, municipalities, demographic temperatures, and we merge all of that data with data science and uh, machine learning and something that we love to use in Adviso, which we call behavioral science, and we're merging with a design thinking approach. So we apply behavioral science in all our principles, from data to design. This is the core DNA of our solution and our company. So what is behavioral science? So behavioral science is a brain science. Um, your brain is divided in two systems. System one, which is the fast uh, uh, reacting system. If I tell you one plus one, you immediately know the response, it's two. This is system one thinking. System two is the, the slow one. You, if I ask you 365 multiplied by 200, you need to slow down and think. And behavioral science and the toolbox that we're using of the behavioral science use a system one, which allows us to engage with people without having them realizing they're actually changing their behavior and engage with you. And the beauty of it, it actually works. Um, this is part of an experiment that was done a couple of years ago in California. They were trying to understand how they could engage people at reducing consumption at peak time in the evening. Um, this was for energy. So they were putting door hanger uh, on different group of houses. The first, was, the first door hanger was um, turn off your AC at night and you're going to save money. The second one was you're going to save the environment and the last one was you're going to be a, a good citizen. According to you, which one of these three groups would save the most energy? Money? Citizen? Environment? None of them. And there was another group which was using behavioral science concept, the peer pressure norm. Uh, you average neighbor are going to turn off the AC at night and turn on the fan. And this one was a 6% six, six drop in consumption. That's what we do at Adviso and what, what we use. How do we position Adviso in the, the competition? We, we are part of, we have quite a unique landscape in customer engagement. Um, our key differentiator at Adviso are um, three main things. One, our solution work for water, energy, and gas, water, electricity, and gas, even recycling and wastewater. Uh, all together or one by one. The second thing is that uh, we have already a platform uh, that works for I IoT and smart home. So we are able to integrate uh, data from smart thermostat, from uh, smart appliances, which is coming more and more, or solar panel, for example. And the last one, and most importantly, our main differentiator is the behavioral science. We use behavioral science in any communication which we use to engage customer. And there is a reason for that, because um, we are much more than just a, a set of solution, a dashboard, um, sometimes people call us. We want to be able to develop for our clients, the utilities, what we do with our consumer. Being able to tell us a specific program uh, to tackle specific local challenges. So water efficiency maybe in California or in Dubai, uh, lead issue or affordability in Ohio, uh, maybe customer debt in Brazil. Everything, every customer is different, and that's how we build our software, to be able to build something different, different program for every customer. A little bit about our team. So we're three co-founders, three French, even if we live in London. Uh, Patrice, Pierre, and myself, we used to work at Oracle all together. Uh, we met 10 years ago, so we have 15 years experience in software and utilities. Um, I, I bring one of our advisors, uh, Jeremy Pelzer, is uh, helping us on our US expansion. He used to be the CEO of American Water a couple of years ago, so he have a quite viable knowledge of the US market. Big market opportunity, um, 21 billion by 2020. Uh, it's a huge market, huge market share. But for me, the most important is um, the thing we can see on top right. Um, the cost of energy and water, even if we can diversify more and more, is still increasing every year, year after year. And up to 15% of annual income from American families in general goes into electricity and water. Some of our milestones. So uh, we have achieved a three round of investment. We raised $900,000 in January. We have eight clients, 25 people work in our team in, based in London. Uh, we have offices in Paris and, and Dubai now. Um, one of the major next steps for us will be to open our office in Cincinnati. 
uh, which we should come around June or July time frame with our first paying client by the summertime, which should lead us by the end of the years for uh, a Series A in order to uh, increase our U.S. expansion, U.S. grow, building a sales team here and in, the, in Europe as well as data science. The impact, you know, by 2020, we wish to be able to engage with 15 million more people um, uh, in our database and being able to engage regularly with them uh, in order for helping utilities to reduce their cost to serve by up to 10%. So reducing cost to serve mean uh, increasing digitalization, reducing call center issues, uh, increased customer satisfaction, or if we talk about new ideas, helping utilities engaging in smart home, for example. A couple of financial. Um, uh, we are going to reach $2 million by 2018, and we are on track for it. Um, 2020, $10 million forecast with a break even at the end of the same years. And how my grandfather used to cut Leonardo da Vinci, uh, in time and with water, everything changed. You can meet me at the booth over there. Thank you. So you're halfway done. My name is Karen Sorber. I'm the CEO of Micronic Technologies. And I have a passion to preserve the world's water resources. I wonder how that happened. Hello. I met this little girl in Peru on a humanitarian visit some years ago. She had no access to clean water. And it broke my heart. I really, I was awestruck by having it in my face, how lucky I was to be from these United States. So I thought then I'd do something about it. I didn't know how. I was a consultant in government, senior advisor, et cetera, in the consulting world and business and federal government. How was I going to do this? Well, a year later, I remet and married a man who had an idea about desalination. And he happened to have 21 patents in his name. So whether you think that's coincident or not, we decided to put out a shingle. So desalination, that's where all the water is, is in the oceans. And if you can clean it and bring it back into fresh water, which a lot of companies are doing, then it provides, a, it provides good drinking water. And that's wonderful. But what's the problem with desalination? It's the brine. It's the waste that comes out of the desalination plant. So you have you know, either ocean water or inland water coming into a facility, going through a membrane. And on the other side, you've got maybe 40, 50% clean water for seawater. And then you've got the rest is brine, up to 60% waste. And in inland, it's up to 20% waste. Well, what's wrong with brine? It's hard to get rid of. The whole disposal issue. It can be hazardous waste once it comes through the ground into the filtering system and out. It can kill, have fish kills and screw up the ecosystem. And it's not being reused if it's being disposed of. And we have a big issue in this country and around the world with not reusing water. So what's industry doing about it? Industry is approaching this with a new concept of zero liquid discharge. What comes into the plant, what goes out of the, it may be liquid, but what goes out of the plant is just a solid. They want to be able to get the absolute most out of the water and have it as a small, small amount at the end. So they want to reuse it, 
and then the small amount, maybe 5% five or, 5 or less, can be cultivated for sil silver, gold, nanoparticles, whatever you can get out of it. So that's what industry is doing. What's Micronic doing? Micronic Technologies has developed this product in the top right-hand corner. We've spent several million dollars in development funds. We have some left to go. It is called Micro EVAP, and it's pretty special. It actually takes that brine waste coming out of seawater or the inland water, it takes that brine and reduces it by 95%. It also is, we estimate on early lab pilots, it to be 65 to 75% cheaper. There's no scaling or crud that builds up. It's not like a traditional evaporator that has a lot of problems and you have to add a lot of chemicals. We don't have that. And it's smaller and we've got it patented. So how does it work? Micro desal excuse me, micro evap, we used to call it micro desal, is an evaporative process that's creating a tornado. So water and air comes into this device, this is one of our pilots, and hits this patented pod, which you can come over and take a look at afterwards, and it creates a tornado with the vacuum and pressures that you would see in a tornado. And what does that do? It instantly evaporates the water, creating a bazillion gazillion tiny droplets of water and there's a very small stream that takes that nasty brine out into the brine bucket and the rest turns into clean water through condensation it's vaporized it's an evaporative process so the evaporation that takes place the vapor comes back in through condensation as clean water it's a tornado a mechanically induced tornado. So how does it do? We have before and after, before and after of, desalin of uh, high TDS, high salts content, and we'll have that at our booth as well if you want to look at it. We've done as much as 235,000 parts per million of salts EPA standards 500. We got it down to as little as 140. We've done over 300,000 in one of our other pilots. That's as bad as fracking water or worse. And so we can actually get very, very high concentrations of salts down to virtually nothing. And we can do it 95% efficient. So it's cost effective. It reduces the amount that someone has to dispose of and it's 99% pure. So what's the market look like? Turns out India and China are really in, in implementing a lot of um, regulations about zero liquid discharge. We in the United States are doing it as a policy and are trying to promote it, and a lot of companies are trying to move in that direction. We're competing with the brine concentrator market, the black circle. There's a $9 billion ZLD market, $27 billion in desalination, but we're going after brine concentrators. And how are we going to do that? We have channels to market being established as we speak. Um, design firms are the kind of companies that um, develop solutions for water and wastewater plants. They can implement our solution as part of their uh, product offering. And there's also product companies that we will, they may have the first two or three steps in a, in a desalination process, and we can take it all the way out to zero. So where are we going to start? Florida. And not just because it's warm in the winter, but because they have a lot of problems there. They've lost a lot of their water access in the aquifers. Uh, there's been a huge growth of, of people in Florida, all the baby boomers uh, retiring. Um, there's um, uh, their growth and demand is going up 25% a year as a result. And they've got all that inland, what they call saltwater intrusion coming in from around the uh, state. So I've figured out a top-down market of about $17 million for small scale in Florida. 
taking on the small plants first. They have a total of 140, and then moving up the line, just going after their brine. We're not doing the desalination, just their brine. Did it go bad on me? How long ago? We there? All right. So these are some of our first uh, plants that we're going to go knock on their door, and we've calculated them to be about $9 million a year. So we're going to market in Florida, but we're still in development. Let there be no mistake. We still have a lot of testing to do and engineering to do. And I've had some really productive conversations with EPA. And they're going to help us test our, we're going to bring one of our one of our pilots, our new pilot that we're designing now up here to Cincinnati, hopefully, if all the discussions continue to assign document, you know, that's a, <laughs> but I suspect it will. We're working with a really great guy, Lee Vane. He's here in the audience tonight. And then they're concerned about other things. So are we, so is the community. And we these are areas that we've proven. We can get nano waste out of the water. A Virginia Tech uh, professor just uh, presented that at a paper, presented a paper last week about that. We can get pharmaceuticals out of the water, bacteria from leachate. You know, we can get pretty much anything out of the water. So we'll continue to do testing as necessary with EPA and other clients. Our team is lean and mean. Um, I was a senior consultant in um, Washington for many years. And um, as I said, I married the man who was the inventor. And I've put a huge amount of my own savings into the company, and so I run it for now. Uh, he's in the bottom left-hand corner. You can tell he's got the welding helmet on. He does everything from the uh, uh, CAD work for three-dimensional de design to fabrication and welding and whatever's necessary. Top right-hand corner, we've got Dr. Jo Don Jordan, who has been a consultant to us for several years, is doing all the modeling of that tornado that's very difficult. He's a heat and wastewater transfer expert, excuse me, a heat and um, water, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> fluid dynamics, sorry, 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 Greg's, oh, and then Greg, my bottom right hand corner is standing with us today, and uh, he's heard me give this pitch, pitch a few times, to Greg's right is Brianna Stollard, who's with us as well, is wonderful. Here are some of our collaborators. At the top, we've got EPA, Comcast is interested in having us test wireless sensors. I've got a couple of universities involved. We've got our supply chain involved, and uh, Black & Veatch is working with us now. I've got a GE award that came to us a couple of years ago. We're working on a contract with them. So what are we going to do in the next couple of years? First, we're going to get our next pilot. We, you saw the one. We need to get the next pilot designed and hopefully up here at EPA for testing. And then we have to refine it for production and sales in the next, say, 18 months or so. And then we'll scale it for higher volume. We've got a strategy to start sales and production in 2019, we hope, early. And then uh, move right down the, the financial path of sales and implementation. This is where we are. Uh, bottom left-hand corner is uh, of Virginia's Wise County. And this is a shot of our facility with our pilot in the middle. So you can come take a closer look at that here in a few minutes. But I just want to end this by saying that I'm establishing relationships with nonprofits and people that are helping uh, in developing countries, Peru, Colombia, India. And I hope that when I establish these relationships, um, I'll be able to get back to Peru and help that village and others that have so much trouble. Thank you very much. My name's Robert Seeley, and not Robert E. Lee, thank you, Anthony. And I'm the CEO and founder of Geo Interactive. And we're modern day pioneers, or I like to think of myself as Indiana Jones. And over the last two years, I've been going deep underground in the bowels of our cities, the sewers. 
And I've been going down there to understand the environment and the pains municipals go through. And we've been testing out technology in these hazardous environments. Now, before I just jump into the problem with you guys, I'd like to give you all a taste of what it's like being in a sewer. Not literally, I'll just give you a day in the life of me. So here it goes. It's usually two o'clock in the morning when you're all fast asleep, not flushing your toilet. You lather your skin with a thick cream blocking all your pathogens, all your pores from the pathogens. You click your harness on, you get lowered down into the dark, stinking hole. You land in about a foot of sludge and your glasses fog up for a minute or two and you're blind. You unclip your harness and let go and you're all alone. For the next several hours, you've got to walk miles along this confining space, trying to not slip over in the waist-deep sewage. There's noxious gases trying to steal away your breath and acids literally dripping from the roof. I should point out this is one of the most hazardous activities a utility undertakes. So why go down there? Well, in the US, a lot of your sewer networks are old and ageing being more than 100 years old in places. So, these sewers are degrading at a rate and failing, overflowing raw sewage into our waterways that you and I swim in, drink from, and get our food from. And it's making over three and a half million people are sick each year. Each year, sorry, that's quite noisy. It affects tourism, shellfish farming, manufacturing, agriculture and exports. So how do we identify these problematic sewers? Well, you send people, people like me down there, or outdated video equipment. And all these uh, current techniques now are either costly, inefficient, extremely hazardous, but they're all manual as well. So you're probably wondering why uh, an Australian's here telling you about your sewer networks. Well, there's two reasons. We make some pretty good technology, and there's a $3 billion a year sewer inspection market here in the US, and we plan to take over that. And how we'll do that? Well, at Geo Interactive, we're utilising the advances in robotics, computer vision, and artificial intelligence to create hardware and software solutions for, for municipals. I'll just call them utilities for now. And I'll start off with our hardware. This is a sewer scout. It's an untethered floating robot that we can easily deploy in a sewer just like this back home in Australia. It's like a little Google Street View car that we just flush down the toilet. <laughs> it goes along capturing 360 degree footage of inside the pipe where we can identify features, then geolocate them on a map, allowing our clients to virtually tour the underground network all from the safety of their office and without getting their feet dirty. Our software solution is an artificial intelligence or AI platform. We're calling it Subterra AI. And we're developing algorithms, uh, we're developing computer vision and machine learning algorithms to automatically detect features and classify them on a, a score rating. This will help utilities prioritise where they actually spend their funding on these problematic sewers. So our business model going forward is to sell directly to the municipals themselves. We're going to accommodate for the smaller guys, but to the large ones, with Sydney Water having over 50 miles of sewers that they inspect with people every year. If you don't want to use the sewer scouts, we can always take in your third-party data through our software platform. So over, sorry, our traction so far, we've generated over 108,000 sales using our prototype systems back home in Australia. Just last week, we've talked with the EPA and we're looking to sign uh, CRADA, which is a collaborative research project to verify and validate our technology for the industry moving forward. We've just received a letter of interest from MSD, Metropolitan Sewer District, right here in Cincinnati, and we're going to do a paid pilot in Chicago in the coming months. So moving forward, our milestones. This year, we're looking to put two sewer scouts in the hands of our clients. That'll be Sydney Water and MSD here in Cincinnati. Next year, we'll manufacture 10 units here in the US. That will validate our technology, and scaling and moving forward, we'll start to scale in 2020 with 50 units and mapping over 600 miles of sewer networks. So turning this into financials, 
Well, this year we're looking to generate a quarter of a million dollars just with two sewer scouts. Next year, with 10, it's going to be 1.3, and then moving forward when we start to scale, it's going to be 6.6 .6 with 50 units. So how are we going to do this? I've put together this adventurous and very technical team, and I'll start off with myself. I'm the CEO and founder. I have over 10 years industry experience in and around underground environments. I have a degree in geoscience. I've worked as a geologist, a photogrammetrist, and a geophysicist, and I've developed several imaging systems for underground environments. We have Matt Clark, our team lead, who's trekked through Nepal, China, and Thailand, and he's led technical teams for the UN. We have Angus Mitchell, who lived in northern India for months on end, and he has a degree in mechatronics and done, finished his uh, thesis in machine learning. Ashwin Varshney, he got chased by rapid dogs in China and rode trail bikes through the slums of India. He's our embedded engineer and software guru. So you can start to see the people that are higher, their values, they're adventurous, they're confident, and they're technical. We have Daniel McMillan, our full stack developer, who chases cows on his parents' dairy farm, and Shilong Lu, who uprooted himself from China to live in Australia, and he's our computer vision expert. So in conclusion, we're a company built on curiosity, imagination, and adventure. We want to explore all the dangerous places here on Earth and beyond. We are Google Street View for dangerous places, starting with sewers first. Come on a journey with us. I dare you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. My name is Scott Edwards. I'm the founder of Drop Water, and we're re reinventing how bottled drinks are manufactured and distributed. So they're way more efficient and eco-friendly, and we're doing that with robots and eco-friendly materials. So I think we all know plastic waste is a global problem, but I think there is hope to solve it. So this is a picture that I took in Kauai. You might notice a plastic bottle of water ruining the environment, but that's not really the problem. It's what that bottle turns into after many years of photodegrading in the ocean, and that's all these pieces of plastic. So to give you an idea of how big this, in, this industry is and how much plastic we're actually producing every year, in the United States in 2015, we produced over 50 billion single-use uh, bottles of water. Now, it's a hard number to comprehend, so I did some math for you. That's enough bottles that if you stacked it end to end, you could go to the moon 26 times. So if you consider that, and that's only one year's production in one country, we might want to shift over to other materials that are uh, maybe better for the environment. Um, and so that's why we made drop water. This is a 100% compostable bottle, and it's made possible by the drop kiosk. So this makes your drink at the point of purchase, so you don't need a long shelf life anymore. And it may look like a vending machine, but it's much more than that. This is a mini bottling plant. And as a consumer, you can go up to the machine and you can choose what's in your drink. So I can choose coconut water. I can add vitamins, caffeine, even choose temperature. So this is a customer using our machine. They're gonna add lemonade, 40 milligrams of caffeine, make it ice cold. The machine tells you the nutritional facts. And each machine is connected to tap water. We filter it to perfection and fill your drink right in front of you. So it fills the drink, seals it, and gives it to you. So just like that, we made a drink without needing a long shelf life, without needing traditional plastics, without transporting water. So the industry we're entering into is the vending industry. It is a $20 billion a year market with over 100 million users just in the United States. So it's really us versus this old way of doing things. Now let me tell you why we're better. So on the left is 1,200 normal bottles. On the right is drop water bottles. On the left, those weigh over half a ton. You need a pallet jack to move it. You need big diesel trucks to get it from point A to point B. On the right, the drop water bottles, they weigh about 50 pounds, and we transport them empty like this. And the machine autonomously fills and seals them. So we can actually fit that many bottles in one kiosk 
and our kiosk is 75% the size of a normal vending machine. So furthermore, you can actually fit more of our bottles in a Tesla than traditional companies can fit in a 22-foot box truck. Uh, we have many more advantages. Uh, this is just one more. So we can print on the entire surface of the bottle. So it's like an eight inch by eight inch uh, billboard. And since we know exactly where these bottles are going, uh, we can make really targeted ads for specific areas. So let's look at the bottled water value chain. So this is how it's done currently. Uh, people pull oil out of the ground, uh, manufacture resin, injection blow models, uh, injection blow bottles at a centralized facility, fill them, put them in cases, the cases go in pallets, the pallets go in trucks, and that's the expensive part. Trucking around water is ridiculous. We have water all around us, uh, and we decided to eliminate that whole step. And this is our value chain. So we make stacks of bottles, like you saw, and we send them directly to the point of sale. Uh, so we can use traditional carriers like FedEx. As a fun fact, we actually won the 2018 FedEx Small Business Grant last month, and so we're really excited to work with FedEx. So let's talk money. We will be profitable with only six machines, and that's happening this summer. We've already got those six locations lined up, and we're really excited. So we're using a traditional revenue share model that you'd see in the vending industry. So 15 to 20% of revenue goes directly to the location provider. Uh, in the next 12 months, we're installing about 100 machines around the Bay Area, and we're using a Survey Studio to help us. They've placed tens of thousands of locations for kiosks such as Redbox, Coinstar, EcoATM, and I'm pretty sure we're going to make an exception uh, and bring machines to the Cincinnati area within a year, if you guys let us. In the next 10 years, we are going to install about 100,000 machines. Our phase two is to make a smaller machine that's about six inches deep. It can be either in-wall mounted or mounted on a wall. Uh, it holds uh, about as many bottles as a large vending machine. And then phase three is to get into retail. So these machines will be pretty small. They hold 125 bottles and only produce one type of drink. Uh, there's potential for white labeling with existing brands. And you can find them in 7-Elevens or whatever. Let me go over some of the milestones we've accomplished, accomplished this far. So we made a minimum viable product two years ago. We tested that in uh, initial markets. We had customers such as Twitter, Anaplan, Plug and Play, a car wash, a concert venue, and it went really well. So we went ahead and designed for manufacturability. We're done with that. We're producing manufacturable machines right now. And two things are in progress. We're experimenting with shipping directly to the point of sale. Uh, from our uh, manufacturer, and we are getting ready for our six machines to be installed uh, later this summer. So we are a team that is passionate about making a difference, uh, and it's led by me. I'm the CEO, but I also have a background in packaging. I studied packaging at Cal Poly, uh, and the rest of my team have backgrounds in business operations, software, and mechatronics, so we have all the skills required to further develop this product uh, during our company's life. And we have top-notch advisors. So Tim Draper is an investor and advisor. He's the co-founder of DFJ. He's invested in such companies as SpaceX, Tesla, Skype. Uh, and Tom Pru is a board member at Dropwater. He's the co-founder of Intuit. And we also have Chris King, who you can't see right now. And he is the chief policy officer at Siemens. And without them, We've had so much great advice from them, and they've, they've led us on a really good path. So thank you so much for listening to me. Please ask me any questions you have. Thank you. hear it for Pipeline H20 2018. They did a great job. Great job. Awesome. So they've been working at it all week. I mean, they, they've literally been, you know, pounding the pavement. We're just working it hard on these, these, uh, these pitches, and they've, they've nailed it. They really did a great job. So we're going to enter into the, uh, the award uh, section and conclusion of the program. And 
you know, one thing that uh, I wanted, that I didn't fail, that I failed to mention at the, at the beginning was that as part of the Pipeline H2O program, there are two $25,000 awards that, uh, that are given to two Pipeline H2O cohort members. So we're gonna announce that here in a, in a minute, but the way we do it is a little bit unique to an accelerator or, or a program uh, such as ours. We actually have the fellow cohorts, uh, cohort members vote on the winners of those awards. It's a peer ranking uh, program, peer ranking methodology uh, that has been established and they, they go through the program uh, throughout the four weeks that they're here. They do a trial rank in week one, trial rank in week two, trial rank in week three and so on. And this week is the final rank. So we're gonna announce that here in a second. Uh, as I mentioned, peer review, they judge each other on different categories, such as customer validation, financials, impact, product, return, capital, and scale. So again, there's two winners that we're gonna announce here in a second. So, Ralph, if you wanna come up and join me on this, and drum roll, please. <laughs> so, here we go. All right. It's time to, uh, to announce the two winners. So, uh, Dropwater, come on up. You're, you're, you're one of the two winners. Congratulations. And then, number two, Geo Interactive. Geo Interactive. Robert, come on up. So both of these companies, congratulations, both of these companies will get $25,000 in an investment um, from Pipeline. So that is the end of the program. I think um, we have beer <laughs> right there and food all set up for you. So uh, feel free. Thank you very much for taking the time. And please visit our cohort. I think, as Anthony said, they nailed it. And um, have, you know, we're here as long as you are. Thank you.